Hello. Today we're going to talk about disaster recovery for Oracle application integration. Uh, first, we're going to dig shortly into the key considerations for disaster recovery, and then we will look at disaster recovery for Oracle Integration Cloud, and after that, the disaster recovery for SOA Suite on Marketplace. So, what are the customer requirements for high availability and disaster recovery? High availability. This is for Oracle Integration Cloud. It's there out of the box. We have multiple fault domains in a region, in, in some regions also multiple um, availability domains. And the Oracle Integration Cloud is spread across those fault domains. And there is no single point of failure in the internal architecture. The OIC availability commitment is 99.9. .9. That's documented publicly. However, disaster recovery is for business continuity, which means continued operation in the event of an OCI failure in a complete region. And this is then above the SLA requirements. Disaster recovery goals are on the one side recovery time objective, which means the time to recover, how quickly must you recover. And this is the the organization sets a goal for the maximum length of time it should take to restore normal operations. And the other objective is the recover point objective. So at what point of time was the data still available? So this means how much data can you afford to recreate or lose because you had backed up several hours or a day ago. So how current is my data on the recovery side? Of course, RTO and RPO vary for applications, depending on the on the criticality of those applications, and they are decided by senior management. However, application integration is a part of the platforms, the central platform infrastructure, and usually needs to provide the highest RTO and RPO. So first, Oracle integration. I'm not going to go into the details of Oracle Integration Cloud. This is a Oracle managed environment. As I said, it is already set up highly available and provides several components. Now, disaster recovery here is a customer managed replication. That's important to understand. It's customer managed and it's an active passive topology. So what is supported? So we have events and we have integrations. However, for integrations, the design time artifacts are replicated. In-flight transactions cannot be failed over. They must be retried. And if there are integrations with scheduled or polling triggers, they need special handling because if you have two instances and both are polling or, or scheduled at the same time, they must be deactivated on the passive side, which means after the switchover, they also need to be started there and also the file server is supported. Not supported are, as I mentioned, in-flight transaction, then the processes or the business processes, B2B for Oracle integration and Visual Builder. That's the current status. So what does a disaster recovery topology look like? It's based on a DNS entry for the host name of the custom endpoint. So the integration instance provides the custom endpoints to the outside world, which is registered in the DNS entry of uh, the, the customer's DNS uh, registrar or in an OCI DNS zone, which is a bit quicker. And then behind the scenes, the metadata needs to be synchronized that the switchover can occur at any time. For the file server, it's similar, but the file server uses a different IP address and port so it means we need a load balancer in front of it, which provides then this uh, custom endpoint, which is also registered in the DNS of the uh, DNS registrar or the DNS zone in OCI. And here we have the same, we need to synchronize the metadata. So the prerequisites here are, you need to provision another Oracle integration instance in a different OCI region. And of course, minimum one message pack, but if there is a switch over, it should sustain the same load as the original instance. So it's recommended to have it the same size as the, the primary site. Then what we also need is a, an OCI object storage bucket for the migration of the data metadata. 
And as I mentioned, we need to obtain a custom host name and the necessary certificate for it because we need to register that in the DNS system. And of course, the integration instance also needs a custom endpoint, which is then bound to that custom host name. For the file server, the file server, of course, must be enabled in both Oracle integration instances, primary and secondary. There must be a load balancer in, in both instances in front of the file server. And there uh, we also need custom host names, certificates, and uh, yeah, the entry in the DNS, which is a separate DNS entry. And the, the clients, of course, they all just know the custom host names of the custom endpoint for integration cloud, as well as for the file server. So the initial configuration, the, these are the, the, the overview steps, not going deeper than that. So we can configure the DNS to resolve the customer hostname to the primary instance. We create the same custom endpoint in both primary and secondary. And then if we have connectivity agents, then of course, both instances must deploy those connectivity agents because they are bound to one instance. So if, if you have connectivity agent for the primary side configured, they will only report back to that one and not to the secondary. That's why you need to configure um, for both types of connectivity agents at the endpoints where needed and also the load balancer for the file server. Then you export all the metadata from the primary OIC instance to the storage bucket. This is done using REST APIs. And then the other, on, on the other side, on the secondary, you import all the metadata from the storage bucket into the the OIC instance using the, the, the similar REST APIs. And for the file server, you need to create the directories, users, permissions, and certificates both on both sides similar. And of course, ensure that the same credentials are used for both instances. And then as a last step, you need to verify it. Once that's done, you need to automate the metadata synchronization. As it mentioned here, it, it's uh, done using REST APIs, so the customer can use their CI-CD tool of choice, Jenkins, whatever, or also the CI-CD capabilities of uh, OCI. This is just to keep them in sync once uh, they are both running, because the primary active instance, of course, will undergo changes. So as a summary, prepare. We have the second instance with the certificates, load balancer, and provision builder maybe in the database. Then configuration custom endpoint and the DNS and the synchronization of the metadata, which then needs to be um, automated to up update the deployments, which also need, we all also need to make sure that changes to schedules are reflected on both sides. That goes together with the, with the other metadata. And then in a case of a failover, it's actually just a switch of the DNS entry and then starting schedules and polars for um, integrations, which, which use those. And of course, deactivate the schedules and polars on the primary side if that one comes up before a failback is performed. As I said, it's customer managed. So we have described the steps here, but the customer must uh, perform them and implement also the automation of the metadata um, synchronization. Then we have SOASuite on Marketplace. We all know SOASuite has a long history running on premises, running on OCI, and running on different uh, platforms. And high availability there is also built in. We have a maximum availability architecture. And the high availability on the first side is we are using clusters. Here we have a cluster uh, picture of the Oracle Enterprise Schedule, which is part of SOA Suite, but that doesn't matter. It's a cluster of at least two nodes. Underlying is the Oracle WebLogic Server, which provides the clustering, and uh, metadata is stored in a database. And also all other volatile data, like transaction logs and JMS messages, are this because the replication of the database is the easiest. So as I said, we have clustering over multiple VMs. 
because the marketplace stack in the background is a Terraform stack. And if you are in a region with availability domains, it will automatically spread your cluster across multiple availability domains. If you are in a single AD region, it will be spread across uh, fault domains. And it will use the OCI load balancer, not as in this picture here, there is the web server, the OHS, which is not used in OCI. What we provide here is just the SLA for the underlying OCI infrastructure. That's guaranteed by the club, uh, by Oracle. So for object storage, for the database, for block volume, for VMs, but we cannot guarantee an SLA for the whole solution because this is inherently customer managed. So if the customer does something to the configuration, then we cannot guarantee for it. Disaster recovery follows actually very closely the maximum availability architecture for on-premise systems, which has been a long around for a very long time. Um, it, the recommendation is that we have a mirror configuration with the same capacity. Of course, it's, it's the, the same applies. You, you need a minimum of uh, also a cluster on the secondary side with at least two nodes. So you could say we, we keep it small and scale it up later, but scaling up takes time. And uh, if you have a failover case, then there might be overload. So that's why we recommend to have the same size on the on the secondary instance. And it is highly recommended to use active passive because otherwise there are, are can be many different uh, effects because those instances, they are separate. They have their own database. And uh, then we would have lots of interference if they would be running in a passive, in active, active mode. What's also possible is to use the OCI full stack disaster recovery service. In this presentation here, I will focus on the customer managed recovery, disaster recovery solution, where we also see which parts are there. And these parts, these components that have to be replicated, they are of course covered by the full stack disaster recovery service. So full stack disaster recovery service as a link here is that the, the link points to the documentation for replicating weblogic domains because SOA suite is running on weblogic and it especially mentions it's also for SOA suite um, capable of doing it for SOA suite. We have, as always, we have two regions. We have the weblogic SOA and one side and on the second side, we have the DR protection groups for the primary and the secondary with the database, with the DR plans, and then the full stack disaster recovery service takes care of failing over. Now, if we look at the architecture of an active passive, on the left side, we have DNS in front of it, same as for OIC solution I showed before. We have the region one with the primary instance, and we have region two with the standby instance, which is in passive mode and uh, data guard and other things need to be replicated to it. And after the switch over, they, they switch roles. So the, the region two will be the active one and the replication must go to the other direction. Now, what do we have to replicate in the case of SOA suite? On the one side, is WebLogic domain configuration. This is the runtime information of which servers we have, names, resources, and all of that. That's stored in an attached block volume. The path is given there, U01 data. The rest of the file system is the boot volume. So the operating system and the Oracle software, WebLogic software is on the boot volume. So if the operating system or WebLogic and SOA suite are patched. The patching must occur on the second side as well with the same tools, manually or automated. But the patches are not replicated. It's just the WebLogic domain configuration which needs to be repl replicated. It's not very volatile, this information, but we'll see later which, uh, which uh, possibilities there are if it changes frequently or infrequently. If the customer uses also shared storage for some um, features of the application, which is then mounted as a FSS 
otherwise it would not be able to you cannot attach it to two instances at the same time uh, the replication is similar to the attached block volume of the Reproject domain configuration on the right side we have the database you see some which uh, databases are supported the database service of OCI Exadata and also the autonomous which requires uh, specific management of wallets and connection strings but they are all supported and they use data card so i will not go into that one that's a topic for database specialists now if we have infrequent changes to the weblogic domain configuration we simply apply the changes on both sides manually or using the scripts or ci cd however it is, is done by the customer so we apply the configuration change normally in the primary side then we convert the standby database to a snapshot standby. Otherwise, it would not uh, record changes on the, sec on the secondary. Then we start the WebLogic administration server on the secondary side. Just the admin server, the managed server is not, uh, not really needed. Then we repeat the configuration change on the secondary side. After that, we can stop the admin server again and revert the database to physical standby. All those steps are documented. The link to the documentation is at, at the end of this presentation. Now, if we have pre frequent changes of the WebLogic domain, there are three methods of doing it. And this depends on uh, yeah, the preference of the customer and some other uh, decision factors. One is using the database file system, which means the domain configuration is still on the attached block volume. That doesn't change in all the cases, but it is locally synchronized to the DB file system mount using rsync. That's what you see on the primary, this, uh, this uh, blue arrow, local rsync to the DBFS mount, which is in the database. And then the database is uh, doing its magic behind the scenes using data guard, as we all know. And on the remote side, we can then do an rsync back from the database file system to the file system where the configuration, domain configuration is stored. That means from site to site, we rely on data card. In the second scenario, we use the file system service of OCI. It's a similar setup. So first we need to replicate the domain configuration locally using rsync to the FSS um, at first file system and then we need a remote rsync to the secondary side to the fss there and then a local rsync back to the configuration to the domain configuration which means we have now data card and rsync between those two sites but still it's an easy to manage solution and the fourth one relies on block volume replication so this means as the domain configuration is attached on a separate block volume without the rest of the boot volume we can do a, a cross-region replication of the whole block volume of course of each server not only the admin server but also the managed servers to the other side which is a tool provided by OCI we still have two paths we have still data guard for the database and then the block volume cross-region replication of course, these, uh, these methods, they have uh, some different uh, restrictions or advantages and disadvantages. That's up to the customer, which one is easiest for them to set up and uh, meets their requirements the best. So here in the resources section, there is first the disaster recovery guide for integration cloud generation three, the first part I, prevent, I presented. Then there is a direct link to the full stack disaster recovery for WebLogic and the disaster recovery for the customer managed case, which I have described now on the previous uh, six to seven slides. Thanks for listening and watching. Mm -hmm.